uh, last evening we concluded our first day of talks on a very positive note, literally a positive note, and I'm pretty, pretty sure that I won't be able to deliver as exciting performance as Joseph did, but I'll do my best. Thank you for joining me and let's get this party started. So, my name is Bojidar. You probably cannot pronounce this, but do not, do not be alarmed, do not be afraid. I come from Sofia, Bulgaria. I work at TopTau and I'm very thankful that they made it possible for me to come here. And you can call me Buck, just as my friends do. And I know what you're thinking, but I have been known as Buck for 20 years way before I became a software engineer, so presumably this has nothing to do with the quality of my code. Before we get to the gist of the talk, I'd like to set the proper scenery uh, so you can get an idea of uh, where everything started. So a few, a few things about me. The most important thing, I'm very fond of bears, and I hear that everyone in Berlin is so that's cool. I'm an Emacs fanatic. I'm generally open to everything in life, but nobody in this world can convince me that there is an editor better than Emacs. You saw a glimpse of the power of Emacs last evening, and if I know we were going to do live coding in Emacs, I would have done a totally different talk. Uh, funny thing, the tool that Joseph was using to do the live coding is written by me. But, uh, I didn't know somebody could use it in this way. This was mind-blowing for me. <laughs> uh, so this is how I see myself. You probably don't see me like this. Anyways, I do a bit of open source work, mostly related to Ruby, Clojure, and Tmux. If you're into this sort of things, you can check out my GitHub profile. Most importantly for you, perhaps, I love Ruby very, very much, and I'm not very fond of JavaScript. I can talk all day about my issues with JavaScript, but I won't. I will ju just show you a single image. You know, clearly there are some issues with JavaScript. Uh, and if this image doesn't convince you, you can check out this uh, website, which has all the arguments in the world, so no need for me to reiterate them. So why am I here? Uh, the first two things that I said are part of the reason, my love for JavaScript, my lack of love for JavaScript and my, lack, uh, and my love of Ruby. But um, the other thing that actually drove me to come here was this survey about the recent state of the Ruby community. According to it, 96% of all Rubyists are doing only web development in Ruby. And um, of them, 90% are using Ruby on Rails. It's kind of sad, but absolutely everyone seems to be using Ruby only to do Rails web development. And this is kind of worrisome, because it seems that our beloved community has a bus factor of one. If something were to happen to Rails, if uh, there is another cool framework in another language, Ruby seems to be dead in the water. And even more troubling for me, Rails is so omnipresent in our community that it is actually driving the development of the Ruby language, which is kind of insane. This is the change walk for Ruby 2.2, the latest release. Let us count how many times the, world, the word Rails appears in it. One, two, three, four, five. I don't know about you, but I have yet to see another language which is so documented dominated by a single web framework. This is pretty worrisome. My good friend Yuan is worried, his suitcase is worried, and I'm worried, because it is worrisome. And what is even more disappointing is that uh, the amazing members of our community have been working for years on tools like JRuby and RubyMotion, which allow you to do so much more than web development in Ruby. You can be writing iOS and Android applications, you can be writing desktop applications, you can be doing machine learning. But no, we are Rails, Rails, Rails. We are so attached to Rails. And we, we love to make fun of JavaScript. We love to emphasize how much better Ruby is and the Ruby community. But uh, let us have a look at all the things that the JavaScript people are doing with it. 
So we see that they are doing client-side applications, they're doing server-side applications, they're doing native iOS and Android applications, they're doing native Windows Phone applications, and they're doing a ton of desktop applications. Imagine this 10 years back. It seems to me that something is going right in the JavaScript community, and it seems to me that right now the possibilities with JavaScript are truly infinite. There is just one tiny bit of an issue. Nobody really loves JavaScript. Nobody ever said that JavaScript made them happy, right? Um, and there has been this quest to find a language that will step into the shoes of JavaScript and will bring balance to the <laughs> realm of the JavaScript programming world. You're all familiar with uh, one of those attempts. Coffee Most of you are probably familiar with CoffeeScript. Other worthy challengers for the crown of JavaScript would be PureScript and Dart, more recently Elm. Um, I encourage you to check it out because I do feel that Elm is pretty legit. And uh, perhaps more importantly for this particular talk, there has been attempts to port established languages that normally do not run in JavaScript environments like Scala and Clojure. Clojure is super legit. You should definitely check it out. Uh, to JavaScript. And why would somebody be doing something like this? Um, nothing put it better than the famous creator of Clojure when asked why his team is uh, involved in porting Clojure to JavaScript. He said, well, because Clojure rocks and JavaScript reaches. And this is so, so true. And you know what? I can think of at least one more language that kind of rocks. Um, and rumor has it that it is also better than JavaScript. And I have the numbers to prove it. I googled for Ruby sucks, 1.7 million results. <laughs> and then I googled for JavaScript sucks. And you know, I have an education in statistics, so I know that this is scientifically correct. But uh, on, a more, uh, on a more serious note, uh, there are plenty of advantages of that you, Ruby has over JavaScript. Some of them are, we don't have this, so we do not have any of the disrelated issues. We have somewhat sane Boolean semantics. There, is an, there hasn't been the need for a book Ruby, the good parts yet although I do have a talk, Ruby the bad parts, so it's not only rainbows and unicorns in Ruby land either. There is no WTF Ruby.com yet. We have a solid core library, which makes the existence of libraries like underscore JS a, a non-issue for the Ruby community. We have an extensive standard library, which adds a ton of battery power to the Ruby language, and do you really need more? You should be convinced that Ruby is a better programming language, and I guess I've been preaching to the choir so far, so let's get down to business. Without any further ado, I present the hero of this presentation, Opal RB, a tool which aims to replace JavaScript with Ruby everywhere <laughs> where you would normally be using JavaScript. I would love to begin with a brief history of Opal. Most people haven't heard, about Op uh, haven't heard about Opal so far, but it's not a young project. Its initial release was over five years ago, and uh, there, has be there have been applications in production for at least three years now. Opal's popularity recently spiked when the vote uh, web framework was introduced in the end of the previous year, Vault is a truly magical piece of software. It allows you to share the same model, view, and controller code on the server side and on the client side. People were so impressed by its capabilities, but they didn't think uh, very hard about where this power comes from, and it comes from Opal RB, which is at the core of the Vault framework. Um, the development of Opal is very active, its team is pretty energetic, and the latest release landed just a few weeks ago, so 
cool things are happening there. The value proposition of um, OPPO is pretty simple. You don't have to write JavaScript anymore. You can replace every single usage of JavaScript with the beautiful Ruby code that you know and love. And how do we achieve this? Well, OPPO is, at its heart, a Ruby to JavaScript source-to-source -source compiler, aka a transpiler. And this means that you feed it Ruby code, and it produces the equivalent JavaScript code. There is no new VM. There is no new bytecode. There are no translation layers. You're just running JavaScript code on a JavaScript virtual machine. And you, know, you, you didn't introduce much additional complexity in the process. Uh, OPPO throws in the mix an implementation of Ruby's core library and uh, a partial implementation of the standard library. And I really feel that uh, this is a very, very strong value proposition. I know that some of you right now are thinking, but we already have CoffeeScript. DHH has blessed it. So it has to be the true way, the true successor of uh, JavaScript. But uh, let me quickly um, walk through some issues that I have with CoffeeScript myself. So first of all, it doesn't have a different core library. It has the same basic, rather Spartan library that JavaScript has. So this really limits you to what you can do out of the box with it. There is no equivalent of Ruby's extensive standard library. And let's face it, no, no way we sugarcoat it. CoffeeScript is Ruby. Only Ruby is Ruby. And this is deep, profound, and simple, and we have to come to grips with it. So here's a very basic example of what an um, OPPO program looks like. It's Ruby. <laughs> uh, no need to explain what is going on here, right? Um, this beautiful Ruby code gets compiled to this pretty ugly JavaScript code. Don't try to read it. It's not worth your while. The important part of this code is here. Let me zoom this for you. If you make the effort to read it, you see that although it's a bit ugly, it is actually pretty readable. Unfortunately, I have a ton of ground to cover, so I'll be skimming over the implementation details. Just trust me that this code is comprehensible, although initially it doesn't look like this. So the, the magic in uh, OPPO happens in the OPPO compile method. You feed it a Ruby string, and it produces an ugly JavaScript string. But we can pretty this uh, up, so it looks like a real program right now. And uh, the essence of this program is just a small portion of it, which is really, really easy to understand. It is easy to understand because Ruby and JavaScript are not a million miles apart, and mapping the concepts of Ruby to concepts in JavaScript is not the hardest endeavor in the world. Uh, usually, OPPO maps self to this. It maps Ruby methods and Ruby blocks to JavaScript functions. It maps Ruby strings to JavaScript strings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if this isn't enough for you, you can always drop down to the bare metal and invoke native JavaScript code if you feel the need to do so. Perhaps you want to interact with a third-party library which doesn't have a native OPPO wrapper right now. This is super easy to do. OPPO uh, have uh, basically ac acquired the syntax used uh, in Ruby to shell out to external programs for JavaScript interop. In hindsight, this was a rather bad solution because originally OPPO was envisioned as something that would be used only in the browser. Now you can use OPPO with Node.js, IOGS, etc., etc. So this will probably be changed in the future, but for now, it is a reasonable compromise. And this is how you can use this in practice. This is an actual snippet from the core library of OPPO, the implementation of ArrayLand simply delegates to the land implementation of the backing JavaScript array. Pretty simple, and uh, even more importantly, pretty fast. 
you can, you can do more complex interop, of course. You can have uh, multi lines of JavaScript code. You can uh, interpolate Ruby code into the string, which will be evaluated uh, in, on the JavaScript side. And this will work as expected. If you want to play more with a particular JavaScript object, it is um, a good idea to wrap it in a native Opal object, which allows you to retrieve its properties like the members of a Ruby hash, or like the elements of a Ruby hash, uh, or you can invoke methods in a pretty simple, pretty straightforward manner on this object. And in Opal 0.9, we have a very exciting development coming along, a brand new JavaScript interop, which makes it even more simpler to invoke uh, JavaScript methods on Ruby objects. It makes it pretty simple to use splitting in method invocations. You can use some rather advanced uh, things like passing a block in place of a JavaScript function argument. You can um, quickly interact with properties and indices. You can quickly invoke JavaScript operators and even global functions are wrapped in a pretty uniform and pretty, pretty idiomatic Ruby API, I'd say. And to top this off, you can actually call Ruby code generated by Opal from JavaScript. So if we, if we have this very simple bar method in the full class, calling it from a JavaScript program is as simple as this. You instantiate an object, and you call the bar method on it. Uh, every Ruby method in, uh, is, every Ruby method's name is prefixed with a dollar sign in the generated JavaScript code. So the question that uh, is really important is not uh, how, how Opal works, because it really l works more or less like Ruby. The question is whether it is any good, and this boils down to a simpler question. Is a program written in Opal simpler than the equivalent program written in JavaScript? Assuming that the complexity of a typical JavaScript program looks something like this, uh, what would be the complexity of the Opal program? Most people believe it would be this. Uh, the performance would be problematic. The file size um, of Opal would be problematic. The bugging will be crazy complex. The Ruby compatibility would be so-so, and you know, you have to deal with uh, the issues of the host language itself. Um, and if you compare those, it seems that you're not actually gaining anything. If, and if the real comparison is something like this, probably you should be sticking with JavaScript, right? But let me alleviate some of your concerns. First of all, Opal is fast. I do not have time for fancy benchmarks, but trust me, it is blazingly fast. There are some issues with performance. For instance, we cannot map to native JavaScript operators, so there is some performance uh, issues there. There is no native uh, JavaScript hash type, so there are some performance issues there as well. But overall, the performance differences are negligible. The file size, not a concern. So Opal minified and gzipped is just under 50 kilobytes. And for, for these 50 kilobytes, you get the power of the core library, a portion of the standard library. This is a pretty sweet deal, if you ask me. Debugging, well, at the very worst case, you have to deal with JavaScript. You saw that the generated JavaScript code is not the ugliest JavaScript code in the world. Trust me, I've seen worse written by humans. So. Um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, most of the time you'll be able to do the mental mapping of JavaScript to Ruby script in your heads. If you're not familiar with JavaScript, we've got your back. We've got source maps. And when you're using the source maps, you'll be getting Ruby stack traces in your browsers. You'll be able to click on the lines of those stack traces, and you'll get into the Ruby code straight into your browser. It doesn't get much better than this, right? So, sure, there is some 
overhead to debugging, but it is not what, what most people would expect it to be. And as far as Ruby compatibility goes, there has been a ton of efforts to ensure the best possible compatibility. Right now, Opal is more or less Ruby 2.0 compatible. It is tested against the very same Ruby spec that MRI and JRuby are tested against, although, let's be honest, a lot more tests are failing for Opal than for MRI and uh, JRuby, but we'll get, we'll get there eventually. We implement most of the core library, which is pretty neat. We haven't implemented much of the standard library, but, you know, there is plenty of room for contributions from you, right? <laughs> and uh, there are some notable differences that everybody should be aware of. So true and false are mapped to JavaScript's Boolean type. In Ruby, there is no Boolean type. All numbers in Opal get mapped to JavaScript floats. Strings are immutable. Symbols are strings, etc., etc. Most of those are pretty, pretty small. Uh, and there aren't a huge issue in practice when porting um, code from Ruby to Opal. Generally, people have to just remove the usages of mutating string op operations. And to some extent, you can argue then that immutable strings are actually an improvement. All of those compromises were done in the name of performance. Everything could have been wrapped in a more Ruby friendly way, but this would have come at a terrible performance cost. So for performance's sake, there are some compatibility hurdles. But in the end of the day, allow me to speculate that Opal's actual complexity looks something like this. And if you put it into perspective, it seems that there is some benefit to using Opal over JavaScript. I know that my friend, Yuan, is very impressed. His suitcase is impressed. And I hope that at least some of you would be interested enough to explore Opal further. So I will, let me give you a few pointers for your journey towards Opal mastery. If you want to get a um, sense of the power that Opal gives you in the browser, you can check out the Opal IRB project. It is something like IRB, which runs in a browser, a web console in a way, pretty sweet. If you're a Rails lover and uh, not a big CoffeeScript lover, just drop this gem into your Rails application and you can replace every single usage of CoffeeScript with Opal and it is going to work. Trust me about this. It's pretty sweet. It hooks into the asset pipeline and does magic. Um, we've got a pretty cool gem called Opal Browser, which wraps the entire browser set of APIs into a beautiful, idiomatic Ruby API and allows you to write code like this, which is allegedly better than the equivalent JavaScript code. And if you still want to use jQuery, although you really don't have to do this, we've got your back as well. There is an Opal jQuery gem this is how using jQuery from Opal looks like. Pretty sweet, right? And we have wrappers for React, for React Native, and for a ton of other popular JavaScript libraries. And because our beloved community leader, DHH, feels that no Ruby implementation is uh, worth his time until it has an active support implementation, <laughs> We have this as well. <laughs> so let me close uh, by sharing a few thoughts about the future of the project. Where are we heading, or at least where should we be heading? So first of all, we should implement all the missing things. I'd really love us to get a bigger feature parity with MRI and the other popular Ruby implementations. And this is going to happen, but we need your help. We need much better documentation. Getting started with Opal is kind of hard, mostly because the documentation is pretty scarce. So this is one really good way to get involved into the project. There are rumors that a book 
on OPPO is in the works. I really hope that the rumors are true because this will be so, so sweet. But one can only hope. We need, obviously, more OPPO wrappers of popular JavaScript libraries because it is easier to use an idiomatic Ruby API than to drop down to the native JavaScript code. And there is this uh, brand new WebAssembly project which was announced really recently, an uh, assembly language for JavaScript virtual machines. And if we were to eventually target it, OPPO and JavaScript will be on the very same footing as far as the JavaScript virtual machine is concerned. I don't know if you can comprehend it, but this is groundbreaking. This means that uh, JavaScript will no longer be the dominating language uh, in the web. So I hope this th that this is going to happen, but it is at least five years away into the future. And in the meantime, just contribute to OPPO in any way that you'd like. There is really a ton of work, a ton of simple beginner-friendly tasks, and a ton of pretty challenging tasks. So there is something for everyone. You can go visit the official GitHub organization, pick an issue, and start hacking. The project is pretty inviting, and uh, I, I think that many of the issues that have to be resolved are pretty interesting. And uh, I'm going to conclude with a basic slide of just a few resources to get you started. It was an honor for me to be here. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for having me. OK, we have time for two or three questions. Who's got one? Raise it high. Hi, great presentation. Uh, is there a way to use gems with uh, Opal? Uh, can you repeat this louder? You use gems with Opal, Ruby gems. Yes, you can use Ruby gems with Opal, but the problem is that the Ruby gems have to be, have code which is compliant with Opal, and most of the gems don't do it. So. Um, the canonical way to do this right now is to have conditional code in the gem. If you're on Opal, don't do something which will break on Opal. So this is totally viable, and simple gems will run out of the box. They will just be compiled to JavaScript code that works as far as you are not doing something which is not supported on Opal. So this is also pretty sweet. Thanks a lot. That was great. Um, which JavaScript standard is Opal targeting right now, and how are the plans in like, keeping up with upcoming standards? So uh, it, it is targeting uh, JavaScript um, free, I think. So the generated code is compatible with uh, browsers as old as Internet Explorer 6, which is a feat of its own. And uh, <laughs> I'm guessing that we won't have to support this uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, but this is the current state of affairs. The JavaScript code compiled, generated by Opal, will run on pretty old browsers. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I actually heard about an incident uh, this year at Opal Abbey at, at the GitHub um, uh, repository. So um, do you have a code of conduct right now, or do you develop one? Yes, the project has a code of conduct. The incident was unfortunate, but it is behind us. And I, I do believe that both parties involved share some of, some of the blame for how this was uh, handled. Uh, trust me, the project is welcoming. Uh, this was a really unfortunate incident. Great. Thanks again, Bojdar. <laughs>